If you've been with us before, welcome back to the Off Grid Cabin. If this is your first time here with us, welcome. We purchased our, ca our cabin, which is located up in the northern half of the Lower Peninsula in Michigan back in 2014. And by off grid cabin, what I mean is we have no, no grid power, um, zero grid tie, nor will we ever have any grid tie power. We are, we are way back deep in the middle of a national forest and for one, it's gonna cost way too much money to get power back here. Two, the federal government's never gonna let it happen. And three, we kind of like it this way, <laughs> actually. We, uh, we've learned a lot over the years. And to bring you up to speed a little bit on how we, how we live here and how we sustain ourselves here with things like power and running water, which we don't also have. We don't have a well, we don't have a septic system. One of the first investments we made after purchasing this property was a generator. And we bought a, a Honda EU 2000 generator. Pretty, pretty light, weighs about 47 pounds, I believe. Sips on the fuel, nice and quiet. And the reason we did that was our cabin, when we purchased it, came pre-wired for a generator hookup. In the little shed right here, you can see behind me, there's an electrical plug that you can plug into a generator. It runs underground over to our cabin. It's tied into a normal traditional fuse panel. Not a breaker panel, fuses, like you would have in an old 1960s house. And then from there, everything is wired normal. Um, we have normal AC outlets, we have light switches, we have lights. And it worked out great for quite a few years. Um, a little bit of a pain, I mean, hauling the generator here, bringing the fuel, um, have to fill it up with fuel probably once a day. But we wanted something a little more sustainable. And we wanted something quiet, something that we don't have to listen to. Not that we ran it all that much. It was usually in the mornings and in the evenings when we would fire up the generator, really, when we really wanted lights or, in fact, if it's raining, we have a little like 14 inch TV that we could power. So when the kids come up and they wanna watch movies, they could. And well, with as little power consumption as we have here at the cabin, we quickly realized that that generator was a little bit overkill. <laughs> We knew we, we wanted to make the move to solar, something that was more sustainable and quiet. The quiet factor was really important to us. And I started looking into building my own solar setup, buying some panels, charge controllers, some batteries, inverter, and building my own type of setup. But I just, I really don't have the time for it. So I guess our first foray into solar was the Blue Eddy EB150, solar generator unit, inverter, charge controller, batteries, basically everything built in. You just add some panels and you're good to go. So that's the route we went and I paired it with two 200 watt rich solar panels. They're not permanently mounted anywhere. We store them under our cabin. When we get here, we can put this in our little shed, plug in the cabin, plug in our solar panels, and they're not even permanently mounted. So I can kind of chase the sun, I guess one could say kind of around our proper property a little bit if I need to. We don't we don't have the best solar exposure here because of how much tree cover we have. So in the summer months, spring through fall, we get we get probably a good six to seven hours over kind of right behind the cabin where I park my car and I can kind of shift them around a little bit. And it's worked out quite well for us. We've had weekends where it basically was cloudy for three or four days or rain for three or four days. We had no input coming in from our solar and yet we still had power. Our power consumption is just that low. So fast forwarding to present day, Blue Eddy sent us the AC200P. He said, try this out on your homestead. Try it out at your cabin, see how it works. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk a little bit about this. It just so happens that the day that this arrived on our homestead was day one of a four day power outage that, that happened to us. There were some big storms that came through the area it knocked down a power line in the field down the street from our house. That field caught on fire. <laughs> Anyways, it was a long couple days. We ended up using both this unit, the EB150 and our Honda generator and basically we kept ourselves alive. We kept all three of our freezers running, both of our refrigerators. 
Rachel was able to run her KitchenAid mixer off of this right in the kitchen without running extension cords outside to the generator. And it worked out perfect. So today we're kind of going to talk about this thing. Output power, what it's capable of, input power, how are you going to charge this thing. We'll go over my pros and cons, what I like, what I don't like about it, and some common misconceptions I think when people, we posted about using this on our homestead during that power outage on our Facebook page and there was a lot of questions that came up from people. And I want to make sure you guys understand really how these things work. So some misconceptions, I kind of want to cover them and make sure you guys understand how these things work and how they don't work. It's a big picture for us. Honda generator, 47 pounds, 2000 watts of power output, watt hours, how long can it do that? As long as you got gas, you keep pouring fuel in it, it's gonna keep giving it to you. The EV150 down there weighs about 37 pounds. Its power output capabilities are about 1000 watts and it can store 1500 watt hours of power. AC200P, just over 60 pounds. It's a heavy little beast. Output power, 2000 watts, but it can surge up to 4,800 watts. So if you got something like a pump or something that draws a lot of power when it really starts up, that's where that 4,800 watts comes from. Watt hours, how long can it produce this? This can store 2000 watt hours. Now, when I talk about watt hours, what, what does that mean? If you picture a, your refrigerator at home, let's say your refrigerator uses 200 watt hours and this can store 2000 watt hours. So this could run that refrigerator for 10 hours. Now, not all refrigerators use all that power all the time. They cycle on and off, on and off. But that's, when I talk about watt hours, that's kind of what that means. How long can it produce a certain amount of power for a given amount of time? 2000 watt hours here. 1500 watt hours over there. Honda, as long as you got fuel, you're good. So power input capabilities on the AC200P. This port right here is where you can plug in your solar panels and you can also charge it off of a 12 volt cigarette lighter adapter in your car. Now, solar panels, how long is it gonna take to charge this thing from dead all the way back to full? Depends on how much solar panels you have. With our 400 watts of panels, um, on a perfect day with perfect sun, you figure 400 watt hours times two. Now you're looking at probably six, seven hours to charge this from dead all the way to full with 400 watts of panels. Cigarette lighter in your car, um, you're looking at like over 20 hours to charge this thing from, from dead all the way to full. And in this port right here, this is the input where you can use the AC adapter that comes with it to plug it if you have shore power somewhere you can plug this in and charge it or a generator that you can use to charge this that power brick will plug right in here it's quite a big power brick um, quite big actually but it's capable of producing almost 500 watts so it can charge this thing in just under between four and five hours so for power output 120 volt ac you get six plugs pure sine wave safe for all forms of electronics, laptops, TVs, things like that. There's four USB-A ports, five volt, three amp, for charging things like phones or USB power banks. There's a USB-C as well, the 60 watt output, a 12 volt cigarette lighter style output, which, which is regulated in that, what that means is if the battery the voltage on your batteries dips. The output here never changes. It always stays 12 volts. It won't dip to 11 or, or 10 or nine or anything like that, which is really important for things like um, 12 volt refrigerators. They're, they're really susceptible to power dips. 12 volt three amp and a 12 volt 25 amp outlet as well. You may be wondering what the heck is 12 volts at 25 amps for? Typically it's for RVs. Campers will often have a input that you can power up your camper off of a 12 volt system and it needs a higher amperage output to do so. Up in the top, there's also two wireless USB charging pads that you can use for cell phones. They are Qi enabled. So if you have a cell phone that is Qi supported wireless, like my Samsung that I have in my pocket, it will 
utilize the fast charging feature as well. So other than the power unit to turn the main power onto the unit, almost all of the controls to operate the unit are via this touch panel. And outdoors in bright sunlight definitely can be hard to see. So hopefully I got the camera positioned in a way that you guys can see what's going on. When you first turn it on, there is no output. The DC section and the AC section are off by default. You can turn them on independently. And there's there's a lot of options to really see what's going on with your system. The, the BMS menu will show you your battery voltage, exactly how much power you have coming in through your solar panels or through your 12 volt adapter or your, your AC power brick, however it is that you're charging it. And then same for output, it'll give you exactly down to the number value, how much wattage you have coming out of this unit, whether it be via DC or AC outlets. The fault code system is a pretty cool little feature as well. When I first plugged the unit in today, it threw a fault on me, it started beeping. I went into the menu system and saw, oh, I plugged in my solar panels and I had the setting set for car input, which basically meant it was ex expecting 12 volts from a cigarette lighter charger and I had to change that to solar. Once I did that, my fault code cleared and the unit started charging. So million dollar question, what can you run off of one of these? And the easy answer is just about anything, individually. <laughs> Let me explain. I could have jumped through some hoops this weekend. I could have brought our vacuum cleaner with me, Rachel's hair dryer, my table saw, and I plugged each one of those things in one at a time and said, look, it runs it just fine. But there's really no point in that, and I'll tell you why. So in your home, you have outlets that look just like this. You know, you probably have one in your living room, and every time you vacuum, you plug your vacuum cleaner into it and you run your vacuum. Those outlets are tied back to your breaker panel. And within your breaker panel, that outlet is tied to a specific breaker. And those breakers are normally 15 amp breakers. And what that means is if you plug in something that goes above that, you're gonna trip your breaker. Well, at 120 volt output with 2000 watts of capability, this thing can crank out just over 16 amps of power, which basically means anything that you would plug into an outlet in your home will run off of this. Now, can you plug in a vacuum cleaner and a hair dryer and a blender and a microwave all at the same time? Probably not. You're going to run into some issues because you're going to you're going to peak beyond that 2000. Some microwaves can come close to 2000 watts just by themselves. So just about anything will power how much you can power all at the same time depends on the devices, really. So before we get into what my likes and dislikes are, I promised you some clearing up of misconceptions or maybe more like a, in the real world, can one of these things save the day for you? And that's kind of what I wanted to explain. So hear me out. Let's say you go and you purchase one of these for yourself and you say, this is going to get me through the next power outage. Do you have a five hour power outage or a six hour power outage with just this? Is it going to save the day? Probably, it probably will. You're gonna be able to plug in your refrigerator, a freezer, charge your cell phones, maybe plug in a fan, a couple lights, five hours, power comes back on, you're good to go. You got through the power outage. What about those long power outages? 12 hours, 24 hours. Our last one lasted four days. People in Louisiana right now that aren't gonna have power for weeks. 2000 watt hours of power and you're outputting, 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 eventually it's gonna be gone. So you need to have a way to get power back into one of these. So the misconception that I wanted to clear up was don't think buying one of these is gonna solve all of your problems, all of your power problems. Will it solve those short five hour power outages here and there? Yeah, it's gonna get you through, it's gonna save the day. For those long power outages, those multi-day things, or you're drawing a lot of power out of this, you need to get power back into it. One of the best ways to do that is with solar panels. And this unit can accept up to 700 watts of solar panels coming in. Voltage range between 35 and 150 volts. So 
you can charge this thing back up pretty darn fast with 700 watts of panels. You're looking at like three, four, maybe five hours if you have sun. That's the other thing to keep in mind. So those are just some misconceptions. I wanted to make sure I cleared up that one of these isn't going to solve all your problems across all the days, but it's gonna solve those short ones. But by adding some solar panels, now you can get yourself through those longer power outages, assuming you have some. So my likes and dislikes, let's start with the likes first. The 2000 watts of output power, I dig it. 4,800 watts of peak surge power. I'll probably never use it, but it's there if I need it. Input power. Input power, like I said, is like just as important to me having good options for input power is just as important to me as output power. And being able to run up to 700 watts of solar panels to feed power back into this unit, definitely a plus. Blue Eddy did just come out with a expansion battery. So in that same port on the side where your solar panels plug in, you can buy a whole additional battery and run another battery off of this unit, essentially, I think doubling your, your storage capabilities. So the ability to add on and modularize is, is a pretty cool feature. The noise, I love the noise. I, not, I love not having to hear my generator run. The fans do turn on if you start sucking a lot of power, but like I said, it sits out here in my shed so I don't really hear it. And I think finally, I love having the, the ability to run this thing indoors if I need to. Like when we had our power outage at home, I brought this right into my kitchen. We plopped it down. Rachel plugged in her KitchenAid mixer. There's no fumes from generators, things like that. So being able to run it indoors is, is a plus in my book. So what do I not like so much? I think the top item on my list is the weight. 60, over 60 pounds, this thing can be a beast to haul around. The handles are good, um, and it's pretty easy to put one person on one side, one person on the other. Makes it a lot easier to move it around. But there's a lot of weight to deal with. Even just going from my truck over to my little shed, it's a bit. However, then there's, there's a little caveat to come in that comes into play here, which should probably go in my in my positive column as well, and that's the, the battery chemistry that they used in this unit. Part of the reason it's as heavy as it is, is it doesn't just use normal lithium batteries. Like that, that old unit that we have, that EB150, uses lithium batteries. The battery chemistry in here is lithium iron phosphate, which makes them a little bigger and a little heavier. However, it comes with some positive aspects too in that have you ever heard stories of like lithium batteries exploding and catching on fire lithium iron phosphate doesn't really have that same issue and then there's also cycle time so our old unit has a cycle time of 2500 cycles i i believe which means the unit will retain 80% of its battery health after charging and dis discharging 2,500 times. This unit with the new battery chemistry is rated for 3,500 cycles. So the weight's kind of a trade-off for me. I don't like the weight, but the positives that come with the weight, I'll take them. The touch screen, I like it in that I like what it gives me. I like all of the information that it provides and it's all kind of there in one place, but it does kind of worry me that the only way to actually turn the unit on is with the touch screen. So if that ever goes bad, it's kind of a brick at that point. And they do comes with a two, a two year warranty. So that's good, but the touch screen, it's responsive, it works well, but it's just something that I would like an override, I guess. You know, give me some option to turn on DC power and AC power manually with an actual switch in case something happens to my touchscreen. Another con not specific to this unit is the investment. The units themselves, they aren't really cheap. And unless you have some solar panels to go with them, also an investment, 
the amount of power that it has available to give to you is finite. It will be limited unless you put power back into it. So something to keep in mind. And I think my last con is something that's specific to me and my use case, but not specific to this unit or any other unit Blue Eddy makes or other, other manufacturers for that matter, and that is operating temperature. If we come um, to our off-grid cabin in, in the middle of winter and there's snow on the ground, it's 27 degrees Fahrenheit outside, I can take my Honda generator out of the back of my truck and plug it into my cabin and power my cabin just fine. Units like this that run off of lithium batteries or lithium iron phosphate batteries will shut themselves down when they get below freezing to protect the battery. So not something specific to Blue Eddy or this particular model. They will all do that. But it's something that Im impacts my usage and my use case. Now I do plan on, someday I do plan on redoing some of my wiring in my cabin so that instead of being required to plug this in in my little shed, I can bring it into the cabin and plug it in indoors and keep it warm so it'll operate. So that's something I'm gonna work through as time goes by. So as always friends, thank you for spending your time with us. We really do appreciate it. I hope my explanations of real world use cases were helpful to you guys. If, you're, if you happen to be in the market for one of these, I will leave both Amazon links as well as Blue Eddy links down in the description for you guys. They seem to run sales at like different times and coupons at different times. They don't always match up. So if you're in the market and you're interested in one of these, check both links before you buy, both Amazon and Blue Eddy. I will also link the solar panels that we use. They seem to work pretty well as well as Blue Eddy just came out with some new new panels that pair up really well with this unit. They're a bit on the pricey side, but from what the reviews I've been reading, they work really well. So I'm gonna get this camp put back together and get these dogs, the, they're being like, they need attention. Yeah, say bye everyone. <laughs> See you guys later.